Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Kristen Ramers to introduce our guest. Today we are very lucky to have Christina Mara, who is a, um, a professor of neurology, also adjunct professor of medicine here, is a globally recognized expert in neurosyphilis and CNS opportunistic infections. She's going to talk mainly about CNS opportunistic infections today. So I'm going to talk about today is HIV associated CNS opportunistic infections. And so I think it can be really daunting when you're first faced with an HIV infected person who you think has a nervous system disorder um, because the possible diagnoses are myriad. But what helps me is to divide things into groups. So I start by thinking about is this a non-focal parenchymal, so brain substance problem? Um, the things that would be most common would be HIV associated dementia and CMV encephalitis, which is now pretty uncommon. The next thing I think about and what we're going to focus on today are focal parenchymal symptoms and signs. So a person presents with a focal neuro exam, may, may not have a fever. Things you would think about would be toxoplasmosis, TB and primary CNS lymphoma as things that um, cause mass lesions with edema and contrast enhancement on imaging. Or you'd think about progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which has a little bit of a shorter, or excuse me, a longer course, and the imaging findings are different. There's usually not a lot of enhancement and edema. And then the third thing you'd think about is, does this person have a meningeal problem? So cryptococcal meningitis, TB meningitis, syphilitic meningitis would be the things to think about. So I think when you divide it into categories like this, it can help you narrow things down. And again, we're going to focus on that second group there, focal symptoms and signs. So when you're thinking about opportunistic infections of the CNS, one of the things that can really help you is the degree of immunosuppression of your patient. And of course, that's indicated by their CD4 cell count. Usually their current CD4, although nadir CD4 can also be a risk factor. For things like CNS syphilis and TB, patient can have any CD4, but they become more susceptible as they drop. For example, neurosyphilis is more common in patients who have a CD4 below 350. HIV dementia, cryptomeningitis, and toxoplasmosis tend to happen when patient CD4s drop below 200. In contrast, primary CNS lymphoma and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy occur even later when patient CD4s are typically below 100. And then CMV encephalitis, which I've already said is very uncommon, occurs even later when CD4s are below 75 or 50. So that can help you as well. So here's our focus, focal symptoms and signs. We've talked about most common etiologies. Toxo, primary CNS lymphoma would be second in the US. Tuberculosis, um, probably second in the developing world and in some of our at-risk patients and then progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy caused by the JC virus. So the things you think about are what we just talked about, CD4 as a risk factor. Other things you think about is, is this patient taking Bactrim? Are they taking Bactrim to prevent pneumocystis pneumonia? Because that would also prevent toxo pretty effectively. Do they have TB? Are they on treatment? Some people will develop tuberculomas or TB meningitis on treatment. Um, toxo serology is very helpful. Toxo in the HIV infected person is caused by reactivation of previously acquired disease, and serum toxo IgG is a good marker for that. So is the person IgG positive or negative? I put PPD, you could think about uh, IGRA as well. Um, are they at risk for TB? What does their chest x ray look like? And then once you get past there, you're going to be looking at CSF when you can, cerebrospinal fluid. There's a PCR for the JC virus that helps you diagnose PML. There's a PCR for Epstein-Barr virus, which can help you diagnose primary CNS lymphoma. And there are a number of PCRs for toxo, which are helpful when they're positive, but not so helpful when they're negative. So I'm going to tell you about two of my patients. The first one is AB. She's a 35-year-old HIV-infected woman who presented with five days of left face and arm weakness. She had been off her antiretrovirals since 2007. She was doing very well at that time. But when she presented to us, her CD4 was 56 with a percentage of 4. Her plasma viral load was almost a million. She'd had good medical care before, and her provider had tested her for toxo IgG 10 years before, and she was seropositive, so we knew she was at risk for toxo. And she wasn't taking anything, so she wasn't getting Bactrim. And she turned out to have toxoencephalitis. So clinical findings in CNS toxoplasmosis, this is a seminal study that was published in 1992. 
Um, most common symptoms being headache, confusion, fever, and seizures. Most common signs being altered sensorium or change in mental status, hemiparesis, psychomotor retardation, and cranial nerve palsies. Toxo most commonly causes multiple brain abscesses, and so this is the kind of thing you would see with multiple brain abscesses really from any source. It isn't really specific to Toxo. I'll show you some imaging examples. So this is a patient who had toxoplasmosis. It's an MR. You know that because you don't see the bones of the skull. And it's a contrast-enhanced MR. And you can see that nodule of enhancement there. Actually, I can point this here. And there's a lot of edema, this low-density stuff around it. So you can see that on these two cuts. Um, here's another example. This is a CT scan. And you know that because you see the bones of the head. So this woman had this enhancing lesion in the medial right frontal lobe with a ton of edema. You can see that her midline is actually shifted over. Her midline should go about like this. And you can see the falks being pushed over. Even today, we make the diagnosis of Toxo based on response to a treatment trial. So the most appropriate candidates are people that you think are most likely to have Toxo. So more than one enhancing lesion, because Toxo generally causes more than one lesion. <laughs> Lymphoma can cause just a single lesion, but that's not um, enough to help you make the diagnosis alone. But more than one enhancing lesion is more likely to be toxo than lymphoma. Detectable serum antitoxo IgG, so that tells you the person's at risk because they've been exposed. Not receiving Bactrim because Bactrim prophylaxis for pneumocystis also prophylaxis against toxo. And then what your mom would say, no more other more likely diagnosis. So if your patient presents with disseminated TB and the brain lesion, they probably don't have toxo. They probably have TB. Treatment trial is generally for 10 to 14 days. And the um, assessment of its efficacy is based on clinical findings. People usually get better within about five days. Um, but imaging takes about 10 to 14 days to improve. So what's primary toxotherapy? What are we going to give as part of our treatment trial? Um, the classic is pyrimethamine with sulfadiazine, so a load of pyrimethamine and then 75 to 100 milligrams a day. Sulfadiazine is a gram and a half to two grams four times a day. A lot of people can't tolerate sulfadiazine. It causes rash if you're sulfa allergic. Um, it can cause uh, crystal urea and renal dysfunction if patients don't maintain good hydration. Clindamycin is an alternative that's probably equally effective, 600 to 900 milligrams orally or IV a day. And folinic acid is given to counteract the marrow suppression that you get from pyrimethamine. Keep in mind that when you give folic acid, you'll actually antagonize your primary toxotherapy. So people shouldn't be getting folate supplements when they're being treated for toxo. This is AB's pretreatment and 11 day later uh, scans. This is an MR, again, because you don't see the bones of the head. And here she had a lesion in her basal ganglia, you can see here. And then she also had a small lesion in her medial um, left occipital lobe. After 11 days of treatment, she's re-imaged. You can see the, the lesion in her basal ganglia is less prominent. And we're not picking up this lesion in the medial occipital lobe, although it was fairly small. And it could have been just missed by the way the cuts were done. But she was also much better clinically. Here's another example of a treatment trial. So is this a CT or an MR? It's a, C, it's a CT because you see the bones of the head. And you can see this enhancing lesion in the thalamus. 10 days later, um, it's gone. So an example of a successful treatment trial, just as with our patient. Here's an example of a failed toxo treatment trial. This was a long time ago. Uh, another CT scan, patient presented with this lesion, may have had one here as well. After 10 days of treatment, the frontal lesion was worse. We offered him a biopsy, thinking that he likely had lymphoma. Uh, he refused, and six weeks later, this is his scan. He died, and his autopsy showed that he had primary CNS lymphoma. So how long do you treat uh, with primary therapy once you've established your presumptive diagnosis of toxo based on response to a treatment trial? We used to say six weeks or until imaging shows no active disease. Now our imaging is so good that lesions tend to show up forever. So I'd say a minimum of six weeks or until um, imaging doesn't show any progression. So serial imaging should show at least uh, stable lesions. And hopefully you would see that the edema got better. But you may not see that enhancing lesion go away. And what's maintenance therapy? 
pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine or pyrimethamine and clindamycin at lower doses, again with folinic acid to counteract the marrow suppression that you get from pyrimethamine. We worry a lot about immune reconstitution with CNS opportunistic infections, and it's really not a problem with toxo. It's, there are very few cases of immune reconstitution with toxo. This was a report in the Journal of Neurology, Neuropsychiatry, no, that's Neuro, mm, yeah, Neurology, Neuropsychiatry, neuros, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry in 2011. Only three of 65 cases of uh, toxo seen over nine years had evidence of iris, and it was only that they developed toxo after their antiretrovirals were started. So it's extremely unlikely that your patient who has toxo that you're treating, that you start on antiretrovirals, is going to get worse. And there's good reason to start, um, I think it's on this one, to start antiretroviral therapy as soon as is feasible. Patients with toxo are increased risk of AIDS dementia, and they also do better overall when they're, in, with regard to their AIDS progression, like other patients, when their antiretroviral therapy is started early. When can you discontinue secondary prophylaxis or maintenance therapy? You can discontinue it when your patient's immune reconstituted, which generally means a CD4 above 200 for six months after completion of primary therapy. Some people will go ahead and do an imaging study at the time that they consider stopping therapy. Um, I don't do that if my patient's stable. Okay, so that was a case of a ring-enhancing lesion with edema and mass effect. Turned out to be toxo, but we also talked about lymphoma as being in the differential. We talked briefly about TB. Here's my second case. This is DS. He's a 27-year-old HIV-infected man who presented with a more indolent course, a three-month history of trouble using his dominant right arm and hand. His exam showed uh, right upper extremity decreased tone and weakness. He had just started back on his antiretrovirals. His CD4 was 6. His plasma HIV RNA was about 25,000. I'll show you his imaging. He had a CSF exam, and his PCR was positive for JC virus which establishes a diagnosis of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So this is a series of MRs from DS. Uh, this is a T1-weighted scan. This is a flare scan. What you see is this low-density lesion, which is in his left frontal lobe. You can see it has kind of a scallopy border as it abuts the gray-white junction. On the corresponding flare, which is a T2-weighted scan, you see the lesion much more clearly, and you get a feel that there's more lesions. So here, his lesion's actually crossing in the corpus callosum. You can see he has something on the other side here as well. This is very characteristic of PML. Low density on T1, high density on flare or T2-weighted. The most common findings in PML in order of commonality from most to least our visual field loss, limb weakness, gait disturbance, coordination trouble, cognitive trouble, but not cognitive trouble in isolation. Seizures are common in about 20% of patients they're seen, and they can be extremely intractable. So diagnosis really can be made based on imaging, um, but PCR really sort of tightens that up. So a non-enhancing focal lesion on CT or MR, as I showed you in this case, um, is highly likely starts you out with high likelihood of PML, about 70%. With a positive PCR, the diagnosis is virtually certain, but about 27% or so of patients will have a negative PCR even though they have PML, and it's much more common when they're on antiretrovirals. So a negative study should not dissuade you from the diagnosis in the appropriate clinical and imaging setting. The only treatment that's been proven for PML is potent antiretroviral therapy. A lot of things have been tried. So ARIS-C, interferon gamma, IL-2, cydofovir, most recently a trial of mefloquine, and then there's a study of IL-7 that will be upcoming, and so far none of these have been proven to be of benefit uh, beyond antiretrovirals. Um, outcome, before we had potent therapy, the mean survival was 18 weeks, but 10% of patients recovered spontaneously, probably using their own immune system. Since we've had potent antiretroviral therapy, Mean survival is more than a year. 50% of patients that die do so within the first four to six months after diagnosis. So a patient who survives that time is likely not going to die from their PML, but most patients survive with moderate to severe disability. I've never seen a patient return to normal, um, but I've seen patients who were hemiplegic uh, regain the ability to walk. This is a study that was published in PLOS One. Uh, went through a lot of peer review ahead of time. 
done by a French group, an open-label prospective multicenter study of five antiretrovirals on PML outcome. So there were 28 patients, 12 were ART naive, got five drugs, including uh, T20. The other patients who were already on antiretrovirals got intensified. And what they showed without a control group was the one-year survival was 75%, which is better than what's been described historically. Seven deaths all before four months. PML iris is a big problem. So not like Toxo, where we don't get into trouble. Patients with PML get into trouble when they start their antiretrovirals. Uh, so it's not uncommon for a patient with a diagnosis of PML to start on antiretrovirals, which is the appropriate therapy, and have them get much worse. It's also not uncommon for patients who are not known to have PML to start antiretrovirals and come up with PML. I'll show you some examples of that. So in this study, this French study of 61 new diagnoses of PML, 14 had iris. Contrast enhancement on neuroimaging was more common with iris, but was only th seen in about a third of the patients. And importantly, it didn't impact survival. Here's an example of a patient that I followed in clinic who came in with some mild weakness of his left hand. And then about a month after starting his antiretrovirals, came back with this. So this is an MR with contrast. You can see these shaggy enhancing lesions in the cerebellar peduncles. And this was the original lesion, which was not enhancing. And you can see the enhancement around it and the edema. Uh, this is a patient that was referred to me from Tacoma who presented with a seizure. Had, she was about six months into her atriplet therapy had this lesion in her left temporal lobe, which was thought to be a tumor because it actually had a lot of edema and mass effect. You can see with contrast, there's just this kind of hazy enhancement, and you can see the low density stuff around it. Um, she had a biopsy that was non-diagnostic, but we had it tested here for um, polyomavirus, and it was PML. And I still follow her in clinic. Um, better prognosis in HIV-associated PML with higher CD4 at presentation, good viral control, developing it on therapy, having it be your AIDS-defining illness, having concomitant indicators of inflammation, and a low CSF JCD, uh, JC virus DNA, all things that indicate a better overall host immunity.